Good morning, it's Zimtex. I'm coming to you uh, from the garage this morning. Nope, cut that. Don't put that in the video. Good morning everybody, it's Zimtex. I've got a new, uh, nope, cut that too. Mm -mm, don't do it. Good morning everybody, this is Zimtex. I'm going to be working on some poppers today, but before I get into that, I wanted to show you a new piece of equipment that I've been using. Uh, it's this new uh, mini lathe that I got from Harbor Freight, made by Central Machines, or Central Machinery. Uh, it's a very simple unit. Uh, it's nowhere near the top of the line, but uh, for what I'm doing here, it suits my needs just fine. And the part number on that is 65345 if you're interested. Uh, it's an upgrade from the um, drill press that I've been using. And uh, I've been using it for a little while now and I like it. I think it, uh, I think it makes my work a lot faster and more efficient and probably safer. Um, along with that, I got some new chisels. <clears throat> and so I got these off of Amazon. Uh, it's just a fairly inexpensive eight piece wood uh, chisel set. Now, I don't use all eight, that's way too many for me. There's only a handful of them that I really use. Uh, of course, the parting tool. And uh, I use this one quite a bit. It's pretty handy actually uh, for dividing out uh, lines and getting to the right diameter and everything. You'll see that in the video. The other is one of these uh, gouges. I use the smaller one uh, and I use that to remove most of the material. Uh, it actually is very efficient in cutting out a lot of stuff. And then I use this uh, large skew when I'm trying to smooth out my, my work and make a long straight line, the skew is great for that. One of the things I really like about these tools, and, and it's not just this brand, any brand will do this, but I like these long handles. It makes a big difference in the amount of control you have over the uh, uh, tool. <clears throat> but anyway, back to the, back to the lathe. Uh, one of the things about this lathe is that it can only handle an 18 inch piece of stock. So <clears throat> the wood I get um, from the hardware store is this 24 inch length. They also have a 36 inch length of poplar. And so obviously I got to cut that down a little bit to make it fit uh, into the lathe. What else is there to say about it? Oh. I it's a, it's a tabletop lathe, of course, and so it's got these rubber feet on the bottom and those really help it stay in place. This does have a big motor on it, and so I can see where if it didn't have these rubber feet, it would probably vibrate off the table that you're working on. So that's nice. Now the main body of this thing is made out of cast iron, so it is very heavy, but I think that is mostly to help the units stay put. Probably the best thing about this particular lathe is how simple it is to use. It's really it's really just flip a switch, turn it on, and you're ready to go. There's, there's not a lot to it, it's pretty simple. So let's get this thing set up and start making some lures. What we need to do is find the center line here. The easiest way to do that is to go from corner to corner. And then what we're going to do is take a punch here with a kind of a rounded end on it and indent that. that on both sides and that helps us to align that inside the lathe better.
So one of the things you can do to see if you're round yet or not without turning the machine off is you can kind of set your tool on top of it lightly. That's super square and it's bouncing because it is square. But if you set it on this other side, it doesn't bounce very much, which means it's getting very close to round. See? Okay, now what I need is for this to be seven inches long. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark. It's a eight inch piece of wood, so I need to take a half inch off of each side. Before I go too deep, I'm going to check that. Perfect. Now part of what I do is I'm going to use this parting tool to get down to the, to the depth that I want to be for this end of the lure. So this part you want to go really slow. Measured a lot. So this is going to be the mouth and this is going to be the tail. So I can gouge that down quite a bit uh, because it gets down to a pretty small taper. But I may do that incrementally because I want there to be a lot of wood here at this uh, end of the lathe so I don't snap it off while I'm carving. That's going to be sort of the largest part of the lure. So the mouth will taper down to the mouth just a little bit, and then it'll taper from here down to the tail. I'm gonna go ahead and gouge out a little bit more of that though. Okay, now that we got the basic shape done, what we can do is we can come back with our sandpaper and smooth it up. But you always wanna, you always wanna sand from the bottom.
cut the hardware slot I always go against the grain uh, when I cut that slot because if you go with the grain there's the potential for splitting so you want to avoid that You can see here I'm going to cut a little bit past center so that I've got a little bit of adjustment room when I put my uh, hardware in. Flip my blade over. I'll make sure that I don't have like a high spot in the middle. Okay, so this is the wire I'm going to use for my harness. Um, it's stainless steel type 302, uh, 0 0.080, which is two millimeters. It's a very stiff wire. First thing I'm going to do is cut this. I'm going to cut a piece 13 inches long for this particular lure. Before I crimp those, I'm going to, yeah, that's going to work. I got enough length on each end. I'm going to go ahead and crimp these uh, and this will be done. All right, so I've got the harness dry fit in there. It looks like it fits pretty good. Anyway, um, I've started using these um, crimps, these double barrel crimps, for uh, holding all of this together. Uh, before, I used some of this really thin craft wire, and what I would do is I'd just wrap it a whole bunch of times, and then I'd super glue the whole thing. Uh, and that's pretty strong. But I've recently switched to using these double barrel crimps for a couple of reasons. One is it's a little bit easier to work with um, from a standpoint of dry fitting and unfitting and, and all that stuff. Um, and I also think that these are going to be stronger in the end uh, than wrapping it in wire. Um, so I put one here in the middle as well because if you get a large load on it and you're pulling, that's going to want to spring open. And so the purpose of that crimp is to keep it from stretching uh, as much as possible because when it stretches, then it's going to stretch inside the lure and you could have a breakage potentially. Uh, and I'm just trying to head that off. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to use some of this 30 minute uh, epoxy and I'm going to epoxy this into the wood. I could super glue it in, but I feel like the epoxy is um, a lot stronger. So uh, to embed the wire, let's epoxy it.
All right, I am going to use some of this wire to hold everything in place. What we've got today is a 7 inch bullet popper. This is a GT rated lure uh, that I've carved and we're going to paint this in a coral trout pattern. Uh, as you can see I've already uh, primed the lure and I've already got the opaque white all over it. I skipped past that part. You've seen me do it on previous episodes. So we're going to start from here and paint a coral trout. The foundation color that I'm going to use is going to be this orangish, lightish yellow color. And I've written down what I've got here. 
So it's uh, 10 parts opaque yellow, one part fluorescent orange, and two parts opaque white. And uh, we're gonna put this over the entire lure. I'm gonna use this mesh uh, to do my scale pattern. And I've actually sprayed this mesh on both sides a few times with uh, some of that primer because I feel like it gives you a, um, a better impression, a better screen than just brand new mesh. Brand new mesh kind of lets paint soak into it and it doesn't give you as sharp of a line. Next color is going to be iridescent orange. We're going to cover pretty much the whole thing, uh, but I am going to try and stay away from the gill area again uh, on this one because gills don't have scales on them really, so uh, I'm going to avoid that area and then I'll come back and paint that uh, without the mesh on. next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over that with a little bit of transparent red, but I'm going to do it very finely and from about a mile away. Got some more of that iridescent orange. coming at the gills from this angle so that there's a little yellow reveal on the gills. Next we switch back to the original custom yellow color. So I did finish getting that color put on and I apologize I did not capture a lot of that. Um, my airbrush was acting up terribly and I had to clean it twice and it was just kind of sputtering and not cooperating but I did get this color on. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mist the whole thing with this iridescent orange. Then we'll put the eyes on but I feel like this will give it a little something just to not cover anything but just give it a little mist. I'm going to put a little bit more over some of these stripes because I want them to be a little bit more subtle. Uh, except those on the face. I kind of like that. I kind of like how sharp those are. Maybe just a ever so slightly. There we go. That's the look I'm going for. So some of these coral trout have a, a little bit of a lighter color in them. Some are kind of solid. Some of them have these stripes in them. I think the stripes are going to make it look a little bit more interesting. Uh, but what's really going to make this thing pop are the spots.
At this point, we're ready to apply two clear coats before proceeding to the next step. For this next step, I'm going to want to cover the uh, eye that I've already epoxied. So what I've done is I've got an extra, extra one out of that pack here. I'm just going to trace. Alright, I got to looking at some more examples of coral trout, and I feel like it needs a bit more red on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over it a little bit lightly with some transparent red, just to kind of get it a little bit closer to where it needs to be. I think I'm going to leave the belly a little bit more on the orange side. From the examples I've seen, I think that's the way it is. But I think that I think that goes a long way. Just a little bit more red along the top. All right, now I want to try and get the right blue for my spots. And what I'm going to use is opaque blue. But I'm also going to add a little bit of white to it because it seems like it's it's not just super dark. One, two, three, four, five. Let's try that and hopefully that doesn't lighten it too much. See what that gives us. Yeah, I think that's a good blue right off the bat. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a Q-tip here, and I'm going to do my big spots. A lot of times they have a little stripe kind of under their eye here. So before we apply the next color, I'm going to go ahead and prep my Q-tip. I'm going to pull a bunch of this cotton off. to make it a little bit smaller. Basically what you wind up with is a slightly smaller Q-tip and like what I've got here. Okay, this next color we're gonna mix is gonna be a much lighter color. It's gonna be more like a, a sky blue. All right, after doing quite a bit of experimentation, I came back to my second option that I was working on. And what it is, is it's four drops of iridescent turquoise and five drops of opaque white. The key to this is to apply just the right amount of pressure to get the size circle you want. And all you want to do is keep it inside the bigger circle. 
It doesn't have to be perfect. If it's a little off or oblong or odd shape, that's fine. Finally, we'll apply two clear coats before taking it out on the water.